So, so far we've heard a bunch of stories about people's paths towards creating design that matter. Some were very long, some, like Gobby's, were sort of an instantaneous moment. Um, our next speaker, Rich Holland from CoLab, is going to talk about his and his firm's journey toward that and the struggles that they have faced along the way. So here's Rich. Hi guys, um, if you could imagine it, what's in my head for a second, it's this sort of fresh, almost funky beat. Uh, and uh, it's there because I'm thinking about what we're gonna be talking about next, and we're gonna be talking about um, syncopation. We're gonna be talking about uh, what we do at CoLab to activate the spaces between the givens uh, that come to us from social profit work. This is really a story about a transformation and how we became uh, the organization that, we're, that we are right now. We started, uh, I started the firm about 25 years ago, that's a quarter century. And, um, and at the time, we hit the ground running. We were very fortunate in that way. Uh, we started working with some pretty large corporate clients right away. And, um, and the work that, uh, that we were bringing to those clients had a tendency to be particularly strategic. Uh, I'm not a trained designer. I didn't go to design school. I had a different path to, uh, to become a designer. And in that path, um, meaning uh, became super important to me. Uh, so uh, our approach has always been strategic. That said, um, and, and as everybody else here knows, uh, that there really is no close enough. Uh, that we keep pushing and pushing and pushing until we get it right, until we uncover what's going to be genuinely impactful. Um, so uh, while we were doing that, we had this opportunity to do you know, just this ton of work, but I have to tell you that, uh, that in hindsight, the work that we were doing, you know, whether it's building these crazy robots from Motorola or, or uh, in-store displays or what have you, um, the work that we were doing uh, was crit creatively strategic. But we find that in the greater scheme of things, if there's a pie that's about this big, creative strategy was just about 15, 20% of that pie. There was a very big part uh, of helping to create these solutions uh, that we were uh, not a part of. Uh, we jumped in and polished the ideas. And in that process, we managed to miss a tremendous amount of what design could actually do. Somewhere uh, about five years ago, I posed the question, um, when is it enough already? Uh, when can we actually really start bringing to uh, the fullness of what we were doing uh, the more uh, that we really cared about? Now, there's a lot of conversation about more, right? There's the issue of uh, is more or less, et cetera, and there's ways of making this idea of more very complicated. Really, to us, at the very end of it, more is more. The issue is, can we be clear about which more uh, we're out to activate? Um, in taking a look at the, the scope of the work that we're doing from the social profit work to uh, some of the nonprofit work that the social, that, uh, sorry, from the uh, uh, corporate work to the nonprofit work that we're using the corporate work to underwrite, um, we started recognizing very quickly that where, what got us up in the morning, what got us energized in the morning was doing the work that helped society, that helped people that we, that we could understand, uh, that wasn't about moving more elevators, moving more sandwich meat, uh, moving more cell phones. So one day after a long drive, I went back to the office and said, all right, enough of that other stuff. We're just going to be focusing on, on work that has social relevance. Having, uh, as soon as we did that, the first guys uh, that came through our door help define what that meant for us. The Human Rights Institute uh, asked us to help them out with, uh, with a conference that they were doing. They do one every year. And this first conference, uh, they needed a couple of, uh, well, this conference, they needed a couple of specific materials, uh, a very narrow list of tangible deliverables. 
in talking to the Human Rights Institute, um, we took a look at this piece of information to understand what exactly it is that they were doing. The Human Rights Institute measures 165 countries uh, around, the, around the world for the past 18 years. They measure them across uh, 15 human rights issues uh, and, and creates a scorecard for each of these countries. If you're doing pretty well, you're hanging around zero. A lot of countries oscillate depending on the points around one, and some countries hit that two mark and are, you know, and are really creating some serious atrocities. Some countries are moving in this direction. They're at zero, and they are rocketing up to this two point. They're doing this very quickly, and, uh, and that felt to me like a very big concern because assuming that other countries were more steady whether they were at zero, one, or two, wherever that steady was, I'm a math person. So I look at two, and then I look at two plus zero, average it out, we're at around one, but if it's moving towards two, we're moving towards an average of two. And that seemed like global chaos. Um, so I was particularly concerned about that, uh, that diagonal arrow. The very patient people at the Human Rights Institute told me, no, no, no. That's not where your concern is. That's where the urgency is. The concern is at the steady lines, because the steady line implicates generations without change. And when you go through generations without change, uh, what you end up with is, uh, is a lack of memory of a condition other than what you're living in. Um, the guys that are taking that big dive forward is filled with a kind of tension, but it's, it's a potentially hopeful tension. Because in that tension is a, is a memory of what it was like before things were wrong and the possibility to revisit that track. That, to me, is the urgency of the social value work, to catch it before it becomes this generational trend where we lose the ability or the, where we complicate the ability to, to create change. The, this is what, and I'm going to read this, and I hate reading slides, but I think this is important. This is what the... Uh, some of the conditions that the Human Rights Institute actually measures. Physical integrity, including torture, summary execution, disappearance, imprisonment for political beliefs, civil liberties such as freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to vote for your leader, uh, freedom to assemble, freedom of movement, workers' rights, women's rights to equal treatment, particularly uh, physical uh, rights and uh, political and economic rights. We anticipated when we were starting the project, we were wondering, well, what are we going to be working on? Are we going to be working on Darfur? Are we going to be working on China? What could we possibly be working on? In terms of those conditions, what we were actually working on this year uh, was human rights here in the United States of America. That was, those were the issues that were bouncing to the surface that needed attention. It wasn't about going to Africa. It wasn't about going to Asia. It was about looking in our own backyards and making a difference. So, the first step in developing more was to try and figure out what the heck we could do about this because the scale was larger than our capacity, that's for sure, to really address in a way that we think was substantive. Regardless of uh, what it was that we were being asked to do, it seemed like it required something much larger uh, than what we were being asked to actually provide. In that realization, it came to us that uh, design uh, wasn't what it was about. The design was just a byproduct. It was a byproduct of something completely different that needed to take place. It was what comes out of uh, charging people up and giving them the, uh, the impetus to do. So the first thing we did was we reached through our networks. Uh, we reached through our networks. There you go. <laughs> and, um, and we started uh, vetting ideas with, with people across social media. Uh, started to try and figure out how we could create cumulative storytelling. And uh, we ended up with a, a, at the door of ASMP when an idea struck us. And that idea was, what happens if we activate photo photographers from around the country and had them go out in their own backyards as an experiment, talk to people, go rummaging around in their communities and see what they learn and see what they find out about a backyard that they hadn't been paying attention to. Uh, they sent back to us uh, from across the country images, 
and stories. And uh, we put them together in a way that we could share back out to the community. Here are some of those stories. If you could do me a favor, by the way, uh, if you are from this place or you've been to this place in the States, just raise your hands as we go through these. Alaska. Uh, this young man, this photo was taken on the day that he's leaving his home. Uh, he's leaving a home where his entire uh, uh, community has lived for generation after generation because there is global warming and the ice cap is changing and they can't live there anymore. They have to move away from where their home is. Uh, we've heard stories from, uh, from Washington, though this is Kentucky. <laughs> so if you're from Kentucky, raise your hand. Um, about people who are uh, dealing with, uh, with issues of discrimination um, in all kinds of places from academics to everywhere else. Uh, we're dealing with uh, inner city uh, issues in Connecticut and crime that's going on there and how we mediate that. Uh, we're dealing, we got stories back of this man who maintains hope while dealing with some extreme uh, disabilities and how to function in the city and what his rights could possibly be. Uh, we're faced with this woman and healthcare issues in, in Maryland. She's 70 years old. She is still working because when her husband died, it used up everything that they had. So she still has to push rooms and work for a living at 70, at 70 plus years old. Uh, and we hear the stories of teen, more teen pregnancy issues and, and how young women's opportunities are being eroded in the inner city. Uh, we're hearing stories about uh, this young man who was so severely abused at home that his best option was to go live in a tent city in Washington. Uh, and when you talk to him, he still is talking about a sense of hope and a sense of possibility of what it could be, what it could be like uh, to get a college education to get himself out of the situation where he's in. These are the reasons why. Um, we uh, took all these stories, both stories of hope and stories of worry, and we distributed them like crazy distributed them everywhere. Uh, they went out to campuses. Um, we built websites where you could drop in and learn about the stories. Um, uh, we created a poster campaign where things, where digital files were sent and uh, all over the, the, uh, the country to where uh, the, the speakers at this conference were coming from. Uh, we rewrote a page from the Anarchist Cookbook and instead of sending out, uh, instead of creating and distributing the bomb of hope, uh, we created uh, files and instructions on how to make your own t-shirt with iron-on stuff. Uh, because the idea is if we could get people to do, if we could get them to engage and to get their hands in excited about doing it, the meaning goes deeper in. Uh, to us, that's a very key way of creating more. That said, the event was actually being held like this. It was being held at a law school, and that law school is in the middle of one of the poorest communities in Hartford, but it's still being held in a law school, in an auditorium, with some people with ties staring at, at speakers and sometimes engaging in conversation. And we asked ourselves, how do we get out of that scenario, and how can we, and with the, with the Institute, how can we actually activate this so that there's more meaning brought into it? We did this by, uh, they did this by partnering with uh, another client of ours, the, uh, the Bated, uh, Bated Breath. Uh, Bated Breath is a theater company, and uh, they were working simultaneously on, uh, on a Parkville project. Um, Parkville, is a, is a very uh, ethnically mixed uh, community in Hartford. It was facing a tremendous amount of ICE issues. Uh, um, ICE squads were going in, grabbing people out and deporting them. Uh, Bated Breath had documented stories and put together a performance uh, that brought the emotional content and the clarity of what those issues together and, uh, and distributed them and, and made it available to the public. Um, so this is, these are some images from the performance. What ultimately ended up happening is the people were take, the, the conventioneers were taken out of the safety, the incubator of 
the university and brought into Parkville, into Frog Hollow, into these places where there's this tremendous amount of inequity and had this experience of this performance. It changed the tone heading in. Um, it changed it to a place where we're connected and uh, in, a in a place where the conversation isn't divorced from an understanding of experience. Another side note, uh, that bated breath stuff, another uh, aspect of more that we found in that is uh, we work to raise those posters to the sense of art. Uh, because what we found was happening is that funders for bated breath were very interested in collecting these things. And they would frame them, they'd put them up in their homes, and it would create a sense of meaning for them. So the poster that was initially designed to mark what is, you know, the, the currency of what's going on was then used to propel a conversation about what's next. Uh, I believe that that's what we as designers can do particularly well, is that we could shift the dynamics of the conversation uh, to what's coming. Our work also uh, from that, from that sense of, of working with people in our own backyards, uh, drove us to work deeper and deeper in the communities around, um, around Connecticut. We're right now working in roughly 30 town, 13 towns, um, uh, doing work with the youth in that town, and uh, some prevention work, some drug and alcohol work. Uh, one of the, the larger projects that we're working on is the town of Middletown. Middletown is, is, is a very, uh, Half of it is a very poor community, the other half is particularly middle class. There's a line that drives down the middle of it, and on that line is a tremendous amount of tension. Through that, the kids end up with a sense of not being valued by the community, uh, a sense of, um, of disenfranchisement, and our job was to take a look at some data uh, that came from, from Middletown and give the entire community a reason to believe and give these kids in particular a reason to believe and a reason to reinvest in their community uh, emotionally. Um, there's, a, there's a statement that I paraphrase a tremendous amount from Jenny, from Jenny Holzer, and it's the paraphrase goes, <laughs> uh, go where the people are hungry, feed them, and organize them. That is what we, that is what we do. Uh, Design is 25% of our day-to-day -day work, going where the people are hungry, feeding them with something substantive, something that's related to what they're hungry for, and then organize and activate them uh, towards the fulfillment of the stuff that they, are hope, that they hope for. Uh, it's to me another aspect of the value of bringing more to design. In Middletown, we took a look at, uh, at, the, at the statements that we were getting from the kids about how they don't feel seen, uh, how they feel sort of lost and disenfranchised. And this was all data-driven information that we were given. Um, and instead of just creating that eight-page brochure and putting it back that clarifies and does cool infographics for, uh, for the data, we used that data to spark a conversation in the community by not talking about the data at all, by learning from it. The kids talked about the data. Uh, so we created a series of posters using kids in the community. And there's, there were a lot of them, I'm just showing three there. There's a whole bunch of posters using different kids. Uh, we created a button, sy uh, button system. It's this little folding book that has three buttons in it. And depending on uh, what comes out of an interaction with you, you'll get one of these buttons. Um, the buttons are about um, a commitment to make a promise to the kids. So the kids were taking this material, going into the stores. They were self-advocating. We weren't doing the talking for them. We helped create the materials that they could then go out into the streets and speak for themselves because you don't ever get a sense of empowerment when somebody else is doing the speaking for you. You know, so let's arm these kids and put them out where they could feed themselves. So they would go out and they would distribute buttons and they would distribute posters and they would be engaged in these conversations with people throughout the community. And the tone in the community shifted. Um, the storefront tones shifted. The tones in the schools shifted. A sense of the kids, of what they're entitled to, shifted. When they were surveyed again, 
they were more rigorous about, in, about uh, less passive about um, how, they, how they are perceived in the community and more determined about how they will be perceived in this community. That is a big change. Um, and uh, the ability to see design get to that change, it was awesome. We also built a website, and you could see it on the, on the right side there, where folks could log in in the community and make a pledge and make a promise. And those promises were really very simple. They don't have to be grandiose. It could be, you know, I'm a football guy, so I'm going to go to the football games, you know, whether or not I have my kid in school. Uh, there was, a, a const there was literature that was made to distribute to, um, to, to distribute to businesses. Whenever there's an opportunity where 10 or more are gathered, you could guarantee a presentation is being made. Um, and at the premise of all of what we were doing here, uh, as much data as we compiled, and a tremendous amount of data around these asset development points for, uh, for kids was compiled, the fundamental thing uh, was to make something that's common sense, common practice. And uh, time's up. But um, we also, uh, this year, after working for this program for, for two or three years now, we finally got around to actually giving them an identity. It didn't make sense to give them an identity from the beginning because the issue that we were facing was the lack of identity for these kids in this community. Now that that's coming, they have an identity, they have a physical space, they have a place where they could have events, where, uh, where support could be given. Um, this is a 10-year funded program. We could not do this work or even start to touch this work uh, in six months. It takes time and it takes that degree of commitment. Because if that's what your goal is, it's not happening fast. I'm gonna to have to stop here because I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you very much.